The opinions expressed in this show are the views of the host and not necessarily that of WTRW, 94.3 The Talker, or the Bold Gold Media Group. The following presentation is brought to you by the host of the program who is solely responsible for its content. Good afternoon. Welcome to Make a Change. I'm your host, Terry Martin, along with my producer, Tom Jenkins. Good afternoon, Terry. Good afternoon, Tom. Tom, I love to surprise you with such mm-hmm. wonderful guests. And today we have Tina Bartholomew. And our lesson today is determination. And this girl is determined. Mm-hmm. So, and Tina, uh, I want to thank you for coming on the show today and showing us what the word determination really means. And instead of me trying to explain about your outstanding accomplishments, I'm going to put you on the spot right from the start and ask you to tell us why you're being honored in the Hall of Fame at Bloomsburg University. So I welcome Tina to Make a Change, the show that's meant to inspire and uplift anyone who's listening. And I know, Tina, you will do just that. And before we begin telling your journey, can you tell us more about this huge honor you're being given? Well, it is a huge honor and it is a dream of mine. and it's coming true. It's really neat. Um, from Bloomsburg University, you have to do some extraordinary things to be nominated um, for the Hall of Fame. And I'd like to think that I have done some extraordinary things. Um, through my four years at Bloomsburg University, I competed on the women's cross country team, the women's indoor track and field team, and the outdoor women's track and field team for four years consecutively. So. It was a lot of my time and energy and um, love of my four years being at Bloomsburg. Recently, uh, someone had nominated me and um, told told a little bit about me to the uh, AD and the athletic director at Bloomsburg University. And they said, well, she sounds like a possible candidate. Why don't you send me some of some information about her? Send me some stuff, some, some credentials. What, what has she done? You know? And so it was originally wanted to be a big surprise, but it could no longer be a surprise that I was being let in on this possible nomination. Well, I mean, my my heart just, you know, was full of joy and I, you know, just couldn't believe that maybe this could happen to me. So um, we had some good conversations. Um, this person that has nominated me is a very special person in my life. He's my current training partner. And um, he had to pick through my pick my brain pick my my boxes of awards and medals and he's he was kind of laughing like this is too much to pick through but um he did and he found in there with my help um some pretty neat accomplishments some certificates and some things that said what I did um so I had to be a standout I had to be um a runner that showed um extra extra skill and um what could, could what if i could just butt in here for a minute this is extra special because this is making history at bloomsburg this isn't normal and I, what right is that part well that's that's true too um because this was uh, such a dream of mine i had known for a long time because i had you know watched that hall of fame the wall and every plaque that goes up there is for another sport that has you know been um, played at bloomsburg university and only one plaque on that wall belongs to a runner and it's a man and um, long ago, he was an exemplary man. He did fantastic things. I mean, he he won every race, and he was just outstanding. People would say, just, wow, how did he do that again? Wow, how did he make that time? Wow. And that was something that I had always hoped for, that I might be up there, too. And um, what makes this so special is that because of this nomination, and um, of course, I accepted. <laughs> of course, I did. With, I mean, with oh, I was overjoyed, you know, just yay, you know, standing up, screaming up and down. Oh my goodness! When I got that letter, it was amazing. But um, I am the first woman in the history of Bloomsburg University to be inducted into the Hall of Fame for for the sports of running. I have to laugh at it though because I I had three you know, three seasons every year of running. Like I said, it was cross country, it was indoor track and outdoor track. So when 
my credentials were put on the table. You know, it wasn't just that I was, you know, one sport a year. It was three sports a year. And the, you know, between the certificates and the, I guess, medals, but also the just the performances that I had, it was it was evident that, you know, I had accomplished a lot. And this will I will be the first woman in the history of Bloomsburg to be on that wall with all those extra well, special athletes. That's such an honor. But now we want to hear about the journey that, <laughs> that got you to that point. So when did you start to run and what made you do it? What made you want to well, become I was, a runner? I was a little girl and I, I grew up on a farm and there really wasn't a lot to do. And I always said this, oh, mommy, I'm bored. I'm bored, you know, and um, we always my sisters and I, we always wanted to be in sports, but we lived out in the country and my mom had a full time job and it was just kind of a busy household. I have I'm one of four children and there really wasn't a lot of opportunity for my mom to get me to a sports practice. And so really, we weren't allowed to do that. Um, that was just out of the question, something that we couldn't do until we got bigger. And now, fortunately, um, I went to a school district where they offered a late run bus schedule. So after school, we could stay after and um, get into a sport you know, and then be brought home with the late run bus. But that didn't happen. That uh, possibility wasn't available until we became uh, a fifth grader. So when I was in fifth grade, you bet, <laughs> I tried. I went out. I tried for the basketball team. It was awful. I thought, oh, I might like bowling. Oh, it was pathetic. Mm-hmm. You know, I was not a bowler. I didn't even know how where to put my fingers in that bowl or in that ball. And I thought, this is not me. And then I heard about cross country and I mentioned it to a couple of my friends and one of my little girlfriends, I, I was only 11. And one of my little girlfriends, she said, oh, I'm not running cross country. She said, I'm going to have to pick up the rocks and move them out of my way before I run up a hill. I'm going to have to do this. That's too much like work. She said, I don't want to do that. And I thought, huh. Well, that's what I do at home on the farm. You know, we run around in the fields, we run on the dirt roads and we have a good time. So I'm going to give it a try. Well, there is a coach and um, he was already coaching for oh, many, many years, um, the middle school and high school programs and had a lot of success with his his athletes. And um he opened this opportunity for fifth and sixth graders. Now, we couldn't compete, you know, with other schools. There wasn't really that situation. Um, they had exhibition meets, so to speak. So today, in today's world, that would kind of be unheard of for fifth and sixth graders to be offered these kinds of opportunities. But we trained with the big kids. So I was a little 11-year-old girl, and I would get to stay after school a couple days a week, and I would go to practice. It was so exciting. I got to put shorts on and sneakers and go out with a couple kids, and we would go along with the big high school kids and go for a run. And we would do our sit-ups and push-ups, and we would stretch, and we learned all about it, and I loved it. It was a lot of fun, and that was where it began. A coach in in Dan, yeah, excuse me, a coach in Tunkhannock offered this to little children, and I... I tried it out, and it was something that I liked. But what surprised me when you were saying that you you didn't get a scholarship for that because in high school, you didn't have the intentions of what happened when you finally got to Bloomsburg. Right. Um, so my journey continued on. Um, you know, from the fifth and sixth grade years, I was pretty competitive when I be, when I got to my middle school years and um, my coach saw that and he that's something I'd like to talk about a little bit more later he was just um, really open-minded and helpful to get me to be able to do some of the um, the running events that I, I did but yeah I, I didn't get a scholarship to go to Bloomsburg University I um, you worked hard and put your self yeah. through yeah, I uh, when I got into high school, I I had a I had to have a job. Um, my family with my family situation, I needed to have a job. If I wanted to have a car, I had to pay for it, and if and I needed to pay for insurance and the car, and um, so I got a job uh, working at a local supermarket in a bakery, and um, I was working forty plus hours a week as a little kid, and I was babysitting and doing just about everything I could. And what happened then was the hard the hard floors and um, long hours working in a bakery hurt my feet, and um, I 
kind I guess I became injured. You could say I got bursitis in my heels as I guess I was only 16. Um, and so it was a hard thing. I had to stop running for a little while until I healed. And that was hard to take. But I don't know. I just I, I had to let them heal. I didn't know what else. And I had a job. And so I just kind of kept on going and came ended up coming back to running later on. But but you saved every penny. You said yeah. that you. Yeah, I saved all that money. Luckily, I had had many, many neat little opportunities through my life to earn some money. And I saved that money in my savings account. My mom and stepdad started that for us when I, we were really little girls. And we'd always put our birthday money in that and all, always all of our Christmas money, anything we get, we put into that. And by this time, when I was making enough, you know, for a job, paying for my car, my insurance, anything else that got st- Put right into my savings account. So yeah, I built up a little pot of money um, so that I had something. I had something for myself someday. I wasn't really the kind of kid that went out and bought a lot of um, new clothes and things. My mom always called me the saver, and she said, "Oh, Tina, you'll have the first dollar you ever made, you know, in your pocket." <laughs> and I probably do. I was a saver, and I I was that way, you know. But anyway, um, so yeah, I grew that little pot of money, but um, in my do you want me to go back to my scholarship thing or yes uh, so when I was in high school I did get back into running my injuries had gone away and I had a friend who was very well off and her parents would buy her lots and lots of running shoes and um, she probably had enough to fit the whole team (laughs) or more and um when they realized that I didn't really have um, probably proper running shoes or shoes that would maybe help me through some of the um, that injury that I had had the bursitis on my heels I realized I might need some more support they offered me a pair of shoes that she didn't like and at that time which was years ago oh my gosh probably in 1980 89 90 somewhere in there and then those those running sneakers were $120 a pair and that was something that I was just unheard of that I wouldn't have even thought of um, buying or, or let alone being given to me, and they gave them to me. And um, that was really, a, you know, really amazing. Um, so my coach, uh, he realized that too, and he gave me a set of heel cups. <laughs> um, he had an extra set of heel cups, and he said, Tina, I want you to put these in your shoes and see how that helps you with running. And then he goes, and I want you to put these heel cups in your uh, shoes when, you, you know, when you're out working, and I want you to use that for the extra support in your heels, because that's what it was. It was just a lack of support. So I did, and those running shoes worked out really well, and they got me through um, till my till my senior year. So I was able to run my junior and senior year in high school, as well as working. You know, I worked my full time job, and I would make practices. And if I couldn't be at practice, my coaches said, "Okay, well, you get your running on your own." So sometimes I get up and run in the morning before school, or sometimes it would just have to wait till the weekend. Or if I had a day off, I would go running on those days. But I had to do a lot of self. It was a lot of self discipline. I had to make sure I got those things in because I, I wanted to do well with the team and I wanted to do well for myself. So I had to make that happen. Well, somewhere, though, that burning desire that that must have, well, we talked about when you were young and you would watch TV and the oh, yeah. sports. Oh. And that built your wanting, the. You, we were discussing the Olympics and how you found that so interesting to just sit there on a Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> So when I was a little girl, yeah, uh, that inspiration came from from watching the old the old tube, you know, the the TV, and um, that was, you know, in this day and age, I wouldn't let my my kids watch nearly as much TV as I watched when I was little. But we were left alone a lot of times. We would visit my dad on visitations on the weekends, and we were left alone, my sister and I, and we would watch a lot of TV, um, and. Every single time we would catch the a track and field meet um, on TV, oh, I stopped it, watched it. Tina, I'm just going to have to stop for a few minutes here for a quick break, and we'll come back and talk more about what happened. Okay. Well, you are listening to Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. Our special guest in the studio today, Tina Bartholomew. It's all about, did I say that right? Bartholomew? Mew. Mew, yes. okay. And it's all about determination. And uh, when we come back, Tina, I have a special question that I want to ask you because I'm hearing a lot here, but I want to know something when we come back. So stick around. We'll be right back. Okay. Confidence. It's something we all search for. It's something we all strive for. 
When we're confident, we feel we can accomplish anything. Think about it. When you knew you looked good, you walked with your head held a little higher. Looking people in the eye was easy. You felt like you could tackle the world. The first step in finding that confidence is obviously how you look. And when you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Get the confidence you need with Madeira Clinicals. They're a unique skincare company that specializes in complete skincare for women and men. From anti-aging to glycolic and even a special clinical line for sensitive skin, Madeira Clinicals gives you the confidence. Make that change. Look brand new. Feel brand new with Madeira Clinicals. Check out MadeiraClinicals.com. That's M-E-D-E-R-I Clinicals.com. Or call 866-646-3374. Take on the world with Madeira Clinicals. And we're back on Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. I'm Tom Jenkins, along with your host, Terry Martin, and our special guest today, Tina Bartholomew. We're talking all about determination. And uh, Tina is a runner, and Tina has been inducted into the Hall of Fame in uh, Bloomsburg University. Right. Soon I'll be inducted. Soon yes, you will be inducted. This fall. <laughs> soon. Now, we're, we've been hearing your story about how you found track and field, how you found that you enjoyed running, a uh, little bit of a trial and tribulation with some some health issues on your heels, and but you were still able to come back and still continue to run. Mm-hmm. Well, as you're going through your life here running, you're in high school, college, all of that, did you ever have a goal set for yourself in running or did you just do it because you really just liked it? You know, been, I'm, why are you running, Tina? I love it. Or did you have somewhere specific you were trying to get to? Well, I think I have to say I I really have run all these years because I love it. I did have or and and always will have a, goals in my mind that I'd like to achieve, but um some of them uh, you know have gone by because of life and just because of timeliness and you know what I've done with my career and having my family. Um I always wanted to be in the Olympics. Mm-hmm. I really did. Um, and I would still love to, but I got very close to the Olympic trials and, um, and then I got pregnant with our first child and, and then it wasn't, you know, not going to happen, right. but, um, I will have a baby forever and, you know, a medal on the wall isn't something that I had to have, but, um, it, it definitely changed my path of life. Um, we were so excited to have, um, our first child. It was amazing, but I was on a great, great way of reaching the trials um that was my marathon in 2002 that i ran um in steamtown and i had run a time of two minutes or two hours and 50 minutes in five seconds and at that time the cutoff was two to two hours and 48 minutes so um you know i had just skimmed it you know and i Mm -hmm. missed it and i'll never forget watching my watch tick away as i'm bumming up that last hill and coming into the straightaway but it was okay. I was winning the race and I was having the time of my life and um, the joy that came upon me, you know, finishing that Steamtown Marathon. It was all okay. I thought there will still be another marathon. I can still work to this. And that was in October of 2002. And we found out we were having our first baby in January of 2003. So, it, it, but like when you were on. young, you told me that story about Greta. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, so we used good. we used to watch TV on Saturday mornings. Um, my my dad and my stepmom um, um, would go off to work or other things on that day, and my sister and I would be left alone. Um, we were really little; we were an elementary age children, and um, they would leave us five dollars on the table. And we'd go to the country corner market, and we would get a whole bag of snacks for the day. And at that time, I loved—I still love junk food, but <laughs> I loved. We'd get a bag of chippies, and we'd get some popsicles, and we'd get some candy, and some those little red s- Swedish fish. And we we'd spend all of our money. And we'd come home, and we would sit in front of the TV all day. And one of those times, I saw Greta, and she she crossed the finish line but she crawled it was the marathon and um I just couldn't believe how her body gave out and how what what she must have gone through and I was just little watching that and I thought I want to be a hero like that I want to be amazing like that I want to push myself to that point someday I didn't want to be crawling on the ground like she was but I definitely thought of what she did and how hard she pushed her body to achieve something 
it was phenomenal. And I'll never forget that. I forget what year it was now, but it doesn't matter because the vision of my mind on that television screen is... You felt yourself it, crawling. Yeah, I did. Over that Because I, I just, you know, I thought that... That could be me someday. But I was so little then. I had no idea where, you know, that running would become this much of my life. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I would be running a marathon, let alone, you know, doing what she was able to do. I got so enthused just listening to that yeah. story. Where do you think running, how do you think that's helped you to today? I mean, well, <laughs> I know one story about your running, and that was a dream that you always had when you ran past this house. This, oh, right. This home. Well, that's true, too. I don't know. Running has got me to be who I am today, and it's it's pulled me through a lot of amazing things. Um, boy, I can't even imagine myself in this world without it, truthfully. I don't know who I would be. I would be a totally different person. I don't know if I would look like I look or act like I act. I don't know, but... Through these years of running, I've been, you know, I've been running for almost 31 years now. Um, through these years of running, the paths and the roads and the trails and the streets have taken me past neat things and meeting different people and um, running by homes and big old houses, which I live in today. Um, a big old house that my husband and I used to run by and uh, just fell in love with. And we had to have that. That's where we wanted to kind of land ourselves for real and grow our family there and um, it, it is what we achieved I mean we would run by this house morning after morning on a I would get up oh, 5 five thirty in the morning and go for a run and I'd take my short run past this big old Victorian house in Danville and um, Chaz my husband had seen this house also and it was just something that we had to see inside. It was beautiful, three-story, red brick Victorian. And um, I had always wanted to be a bed and breakfast owner. So, of course, I shared that with my husband before we got married and everything. And um, trying to help me fulfill a dream, you know, we thought, well, let's go in that house someday. And, and we did, and we loved it even more on the inside. And um, until we were really able to afford it, which that's a neat little story in and of itself, until we were really able to afford it and get there, um, you know, uh, here, we, like, here we are. I mean, here, here we are. But it, we have four children that we are uh, raising and loving so much, and it's like a giant dollhouse. But now also with our bed and breakfast there, that house that we used to run by. So you did, did, you we, did make it a bed and breakfast? We did. We and did. it's awesome. called the Doctor's Inn. It and is. how did you come across it, that name? This place is beautiful. It's if you're called, ever in Danville, anyone has to stop there. This is amazing, just like you. Oh, thanks. Well, the Doctor's Inn came about because the house for many years, um, one room of the house was the waiting room and the other room was the examination room. From the 1930s to the 1950s, it belonged to a doctor and he had his own private office practice there. And he was also a surgeon at the local Geisinger Hospital. And then after he had finished up his practice, he sold it to another doctor and um, he uh, um, Dr. Curry had um, picked it up and he had had his own office practice there for from the 1950s to the 1980s. Now he had his own practice there, but he was also a Geisinger, or he was also a Merck doctor, excuse me. And um, so this house was known to many people where they would go to get their physicals or they would go to be seen for some something that was ailing them and get some kind of medication and then be on their merry way. So the examination room was there, and it was at one time all draperied and dark, and now we turned it into um, open and fresh and light and beautiful, and um, the name for the bed and breakfast didn't come that quick. I mean, I had lists and lists and lists of names that might be appropriate for that, but I was looking through the comics one day in the Sunday newspaper, and little peanuts, the little peanuts comment, uh, comics, I don't know if it was Peppermint Patty or... Little Marcy, but the one that always says the doctor is in, and Lucy. she sets Lucy, Lucy yeah. she sets in her. The doctor is in, and there it was, and I still have that comic. Just I smack you right in, in the face. <laughs> smack me in the face. The doctor is in, and I said the doctor's in. The doctor's in, and there it was. It was just really neat, and that's what we stuck with forever. It was, it's perfect. How long have you guys been there with the uh, the bed and breakfast now? Um, it's about 13 and a half years wow. that we've owned and run the bed and breakfast, and they have done so much work to this. Mm. And my question is, even then, you kept running through all of this. So on top of this, one thing that we have not even 
hit on at all. You went to Bloomsburg, but you went there because on top of all of this, she's a Spanish teacher, correct? Right. I'm a Spanish tea for, so teacher. She has a full time job. She runs how many how many miles a day? Well, on a typical day, I'll try to run between six and eight, nine miles a day. That's a, just a regular day. So, it, so how do you do that to start with? <laughs> I mean, and the children, and right. the bed and breakfast, yeah. and, and the husband. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And yourself. <laughs> now this is just my life. This is what. Well, so think we about when she was growing up. I mean, she'd get up really early. She'd go to school all day long. Full-time job, plus the running on that yeah. end. You just haven't stopped since you were 11. And, and look at her, how petite that's she right. is. Maybe that's, maybe that's why I'm starting to lose my memory and all kinds of things. <laughs> I haven't stopped since I was 11. Well, we talked about losing memory and as we get old, trying to remember everything. And I said, no, someone who does as much as you do, you're entitled to forget more because... <laughs> you can use that to your advantage. <laughs> right. Well, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. I do overbook myself. I double book myself. And then other times, well, I forget things here and there, and I have to just say something, you know, and people understand. Luckily, they, they know I'm a busy mom, a busy person. Well, could you tell us what a day is like for you, when you from the minute you wake up? <laughs> well, today was an interesting day. <laughs> I think you should tell that. <laughs> Well, I woke my girls up real early. Um, we we were all excited. Um, we we're going to visit my family today in Tunkanic, and um, they are so excited to visit Grammy. And so uh, a typical, or for today, the girls had laid out all their clothes the night before, all their swimming clothes. They were going to come up to go swimming and all their clothes to wear. And we hopped in the car at 630 in the morning, and we drove about an hour and a half, and we got to Grandma's house, and we spent some time with her. But on the way, well, on the way, we had two kids um, get car sick, which is pretty typical. But I was driving myself. My husband wasn't with me. So that's always exciting to stop along the road and clean up, you know, children and take care of that. And they're crying and upset and then continue along the way. That's the start of my day. I didn't get a run in today. I am taking a day off, believe it or not. Um, sometimes the body needs a, a day rest and this is going to be my rest day spending it with family it's the best way to do that but um a typical day really i mean on a school day oh my goodness we all i'm up at five the kids are up at six everybody's out the door at seven i'm teaching by seven forty. i teach until a little after three in the afternoon and i make an hour every day and this is key to my life an hour every day after my teaching time to run it's what we laugh at, I call it my hour of power. And it's my rejuvenation and my decompression. I decompress after a long day of 130 or plus students, and then I get ready to go home to my own children. And that is my hour of power. And while I do that, I talk a million miles a minute to my friends, my running friends, or myself. Um, I mean, I just think about things and let that hour happen, no matter if I go on a hilly run, a flat run, you know, in the rain, in the snow, people can't believe they see us out there running. They see me out there running like, are you really going to run today? And I have to. It's almost just like getting up and drinking a glass of water or getting up in the morning and, you know, eating your breakfast. You just do it. It's breathing. It's sleeping. It's running. It, it's just part of my day. And then, you know, we go through homework and take care of dinner and do my lesson plans and correct my papers and all that and then call the day but I am done I have to tell you I put the kids to bed by 8 30 at night and I'm done I'm in bed and I'm crashed by nine but what happens when you have your your people come from uh, the bed and breakfast how well, do you handle that on top of all this yeah well that's where my amazing husband helps out quite a lot we we know that this is a, a thing that we've done together and my husband Chaz has been um, really, he's not afraid to clean toilets and he's not afraid to set a table. Um, Chaz is great. He never knew what a bed and breakfast was until he had to do some traveling and he went to some bed and breakfast and saw how gentle people were and how kind they were and how welcoming they could be. Um, up until that point, he had always traveled and stayed at hotels. But because he knew that that was a dream of mine and that was something that he was probably going to have to do whether he wanted to do or not, <laughs> he thought he better figure out that was kind of his education, go and stay at a bed and breakfast. But Chaz is the one um, that that sees it through because when I have to leave at seven o'clock in the morning, you know, um, I have to have breakfast already. And luckily his job, you know, his career, he also has a full time career job. He's in sales and um 
he will complete the task. But this is what my husband does. If you think I'm amazing, he's also quite amazing because, you know, he gets the kids breakfast. I leave and go to work to teach. And then he gets them on the bus and to daycare and back in time to serve breakfast to our guests. And mm-hmm. we coordinate that all. It's like a juggling act. If you could call it the Bartholomew Circus, it would be truly, truly mm-hmm. maybe a better name for, her, you know. But Chaz gets back to the B&B in time to serve the guests patiently, calmly, and, and you know, with a smile every, every time. You know, Tina, you make it sound so easy that it's, and I know that it isn't, but even this bed and breakfast, when you bought that, that needed a lot of work. And I know even financially, what I'm trying to say here is everyone has it hard and somehow we, you don't quit. We can't quit. And don't answer that and don't move forward on that because this is the perfect opportunity to take a quick break and then you can elaborate when we okay. get come right back. This is Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. Don't go away. Confidence. It's something we all search for. It's something we all strive for. When we're confident, we feel we can accomplish anything. Think about it. When you knew you looked good, you walked with your head held a little higher. Looking people in the eye was easy. You felt like you could tackle the world. The first step in finding that confidence is obviously how you look. And when you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Get the confidence you need with Madeira Clinicals. They're a unique skincare company that specializes in complete skincare for women and men. From anti-aging to glycolic and even a special clinical line for sensitive skin, Madeira Clinicals gives you the confidence. Make that change. Look brand new. Feel brand new with Madeira Clinicals. Check out MadeiraClinicals.com. That's M-E-D-E-R-I Clinicals.com. Or call 866-646-3374. Take on the world with Madeira Clinicals. And we're back on Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. I'm Tom Jenkins, along with your host, Terry Martin. If you have any questions for Terry at any time, you can always give her a call at 866-646-3374 or check out MadariClinicals.com for uh, everything that Terry has to offer. And also, if you have any questions or uh, inquiries about even maybe getting on the show, uh, you know how to make changes in your life. And this show is all about making change. Today, we're talking about determination in life in general and really no specific area. And, uh, and we've got the epitome of determination in the studio today, Tina Bartholomew, who uh, I'm just tired listening to everything she does on a mm-hmm. daily basis. Um, and, and you you guys, we were, before the break, you were talking about your bed and breakfast that uh, your husband, well, that you dreamed of, and kind of he jumped right in with you, which is fantastic, and, and the, a, a normal day that you guys have. What's the name of the bed and breakfast again? It's named The Doctor's Inn. And where is it? It's in Danville, Pennsylvania. If anybody wants more info on that, where can they get oh, information on that? Yes, we have our own website, um, and it's at thedoctorsin.com. The Doctor's the Inn. Doctors. Doctors, and Inn is I-N-N, obviously. I-N-N, yes. Okay. In, you know, yes, thedoctorsin.com. We'll definitely check it out. Um, now, before the break... Terry had mentioned that uh, you didn't just turn key and bam, there's a bed and breakfast. You had to have a lot of determination behind that. Can you tell us about that? Right. So, you know, it was very early in my life um, when this bed and breakfast came about in our lives. Um, I was only 28 years old and I actually thought that a bed and breakfast wasn't going to happen in my life until I was probably well into my 40s, you know, and I thought that'd be a great retirement job to have after teaching. You're in your 40s? You have, this is radio. Yeah. You have to see, she does not, on, I thought you were still in your early 30s. Honest to goodness. Mm, thank you. And that's not me kissing your butt either. <laughs> that's the truth. <laughs> yes. Um, so my husband and I had started started with a typical home that most people would and it was um, on a sweet little street in Danville and we lived there for a few years and this bed and breakfast well um, excuse me this house came up for sale that I had told you about earlier that we were running by and we had gone to look at it and we loved it and the asking price though was far too far too much um and so we were we were disappointed but there was nothing we could have done um I was just starting in my teaching career and you know I had I had um, a, a great situation with a school district nearby. I had a contracted position. My husband was in sales, but the both of us, both of us together, I mean, we're really making just 
average income. And so we were able to handle a typical three bedroom home and we were quite proud of that to have owned our own home and um, working on that Um, but for us to think that we could even go into the possibilities of this huge old Victorian was something else but interestingly enough uh, we thought you know if we really do well and we save all of our pennies and literally we had a jar to save our coins and we had a jar and we uh, thought let's think about our approach here what can we do and so we would really I mean we would we were adamant about paying one principal payment um, for a house and then four uh, other payments that would go right, I mean, right onto the, I said that wrong, a mortgage payment and then interest. four payments on the principal. Mm-hmm. So we were knocking down the interest like crazy. So we had to, you know, leave the opportunity go to even think of buying this house for a little while, and but it actually came up for sale. And, you know, we wanted to go in and see it. We saw it and we knew that was it. Um, then, Wait a minute, you you dreamed about this house, wanting that house, when it wasn't even for sale. And right, then, you saw it, and then it came for and sale. And then it did. And then, so yeah, and then we went in and loved it, and then it was on the market for two years. Nobody wanted a big old dinosaur of a house. I call it a dinosaur, because it's literally huge. It's 5,400 square feet. Wow. Yeah, wow. And um, so... And, well, and how much did it cost so, a week to yeah. heat that in the beginning? In our first years of living there, it was oil, hot water. And, well, it was actually, it, it became every two weeks, we were filling up in the winter months with oil, and it was 900 plus dollars every two weeks. So it was really, cool. you would think we were millionaires to be able to pay that, but we weren't. We had just saved as much as we could. Everything we would bring in, we would be spending in the oil. So we were really going through um, about $10,000 a year just in heating oil. Well, I want to hear what happened. Let's back up a little bit. Okay. You said you, you and your husband went in and you looked at it. And so we looked at it. We loved it. It sat on the market for two years, and Chaz and I just decided we're going to pay our bill, or our mortgage, and we're going to do our best and, and pay off our school loans and everything. I mean, we didn't need things. We were, un, we were fortunately not the kind of people that go on big vacations, buy big fancy cars, or buy anything fancy. Mm-hmm. We run, and we find a lot of you know happiness in that, and we were with our family, so we didn't we just didn't spend our money on other things. And lo and behold, that house, two years later, sold to someone. And I thought my heart was just going to break. You know, we were at a Christmas party and a realtor said, Tina, Chaz, I have something to tell you. And we knew just by the look on her face, the house had sold. And it did. But, you know, we thought, well, it's just not our time. It's just not time. I'm too young. We're too young. It's just not right. We never, though, you know, stop thinking that it could be a possibility. Anyway, these people that bought it lived there for two years, two years, and then they had to move on in their lives, um, and the house came up for sale again. And I kid you not, it was the fall of 2000, it was in October of 2000, and I was coaching a cross-country team, and I was at Danville High School with my cross-country team, and I'm running across the field trying to get to my runners, getting at the one mile mark. And um, I was running after them. And here is this woman who is the realtor, was the first, you know, the realtor in the first place. And her children were running on the cross country team for Danville. And mine were from Montgomery. And um, she said, she's like, Tina. And she's screaming to me across the field. And I'm like, hey, how you doing? How you doing? And she's like, I have something to tell you. And I go, oh. and I just stop for a second. I'm like, wait, I have to go get my kids. I'll be right back. And so I went to the mile mark. I gave them all their mile splits. I cheered them on. And then I went back over after the meet. And I said, is it, is it what I think you're going to say? And she said, it is. The house is up for sale again. And I, I just like chills, chills. And I just couldn't believe it. I talked to her for a few minutes. I went home and to my husband. And I called him at work and he, we just couldn't believe it. It was happening. So we went to see the house again, even though we knew we wanted it no matter what. We went to see it again if everything was still somewhat intact and it was it was just what we wanted and we did everything we could interesting little bit about that the house was still quite expensive you know but they were here five years later asking the same amount that they had asked five years earlier <laughs> we still couldn't pay it <laughs> even though we paid we were on our very last mortgage payment of our three bedroom little home on our very last one we had in five Oof. years accomplished our $75,000 loan. And we did. We did. We were paying that. And um, 
it was pretty awesome. I thought, oh my goodness, this is this is timing or what? So we figured it out. But I still was like, well, if we buy this house for this amount, how are we going to afford to pay, to fix it up? What are we going to do? So we talked about that. And although it was like what we wanted, we had to think about this in the background thing. What? How are we going to play our cards right? How are we not going to buy this house and live, you know, like freezing in the winter and sweating in the summer? And how are we going to let the cracks just come, you know, opening up? Or what are we going to do? So it was interesting because my aunt um, it was an exceptional part of that. And um um, she gave us some really great advice. She just said, just low, go low on the price. Just be, think of a price, think of what you can do, think of what the work is that you need to go into that with. And she did. And she talked to us up through that and she said, just give them an offer. So we did. And we literally went in an offer of about $55,000 less than they wow. were asking. You really low Which I them. felt, I felt almost embarrassed to do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, but I mean, it was it was well we could do, you know, it was all we could do. And we had also had a contractor come to look at the house and tell us what needed to be done immediately. I mean, there was a huge leak in the chimney area, which came down over the stairwell and it leaked every rainstorm, every snowstorm. It leaked. You could see the huge puddle on the ceiling and the, the mm. ceiling was starting to come down. So you knew you were dealing with that. The back porch area, uh, which used to be the doctor's uh, examination room leaked like a sieve there was 20 buckets in any given rainstorm and we could see the watermarks you know so there were a lot of things like that it needed all brand new windows um a lot of cosmetic work it needed for sure but the house structurally is a beast Mm -hmm. i mean it is the strongest house and the woodwork inside was is nothing you'll ever find and except in another victorian home that was built in that same time period so anyway, we um, we loved it so much and we got some figures in and we thought, oh, my word, how are we going to do something like that on top of what it what this house was being, you know, asked for to pay for. And so we had low gone low and the couple came back with a counter offer. So they came down about 10,000 from their original offer. And then we came up and they came down I and mean, we went back and forth about three or four times. And finally, we met in the middle and they accepted and we couldn't believe it. I mean, we just could not believe that we were getting that home with a beautiful lawn and brickwork. Um, it's got a, a fence in the back. It's not, well, there's some iron fence on it and a brick wall um, on two sides of the property with a beautiful brick carriage house. It was like Chaz and I, we are going to be moving from a regular lifestyle into like noble, t- you know, living like, a aristocracy prince. yeah, yeah. It's just like a prince and princess you know we were going mm-hmm. to be moving to this and we couldn't believe it because coming from where i came from you know living in a tiny little place a tiny little home that my parents were so proud to to build and grow i can't believe that little tina was going to be living in this huge huge house so here we were buying it and um you know we got there and man we just dug in we dug in and we had people working on it right away and we we didn't gut the house and start and do everything to the you know to the top of the line. We went room by room. We did job by job, and you know we had we but worked through on it. it all. Did you ever get discouraged and say ah and afraid? Oh, we shouldn't have done this. This is oh. so. I mean, oh no! In fact, this was probably the most adventurous thing. Well. In money wise that I've ever done, most adventurous would probably be some of the runs that I've gone on in my life. But, uh, you know, but this is probably one of the most financially adventurous things um, that we've ever done. It was very scary. We we actually took a lien loan on our home, which I only knew that we could handle because of who we were. Chaz and I, you know, we had two good, great jobs and we believed in one another and we knew this was our dream and we weren't going to let it through. You know, we weren't going to stop at that. So we took a lien loan on our home, our little home that once we sold that, that was going to be the equity. So those five years that we thought we missed out, we didn't, we were building, we were growing into that and we were giving ourselves that equity, equity to buy that house. And, and we had it. And once it did sell, that was right on. And and, and we carried on. Well, I wanted to bring all of these other factors of how you have done so many amazing things in your life. But basically, we were talking about running now, and 
I wanted to see if we could get back now to Bloomsburg and how you ended up there, which was quite a surprise. So you mean with the Hall of Fame right now? Well, or? well, you're in the Hall of Fame, but before the Hall of Fame ever happened, you, we were talking about your coach when oh. you first oh. signed in to go to Bloomsburg School to even start with. Well, without a scholarship. Yeah, I, I have to say in my life, um, I have been somehow blessed with um, several opportunities or several doors open wide for me that have brought me to um, the path to be, you know, to go on the path that I have been on and still going through today. But, um, you know, from that very beginning of um, Coach Daniels in fifth grade to um, he, he saw me all the way through high school to going on to Bloomsburg University, I never thought I was going to go to college. I really didn't. I, I, my parents didn't go to college. I was first generation college and um, I didn't even know what to do. I luckily had a, a guidance counselor who offered me an opportunity, an application, and he sat with me and helped me fill it out. Um, and he brought up Bloomsburg University and that was like the second time in my life I had heard of Bloomsburg University. Um, my mom actually, um, was with me uh, was about a year before that in my my junior senior year excuse me senior year of high school my cross country team we did very very well at districts we won districts in my senior year and we were called the pack attack but i was not i was a good runner at that time and i was a solid runner but i wasn't exceptional and i got looked over quite a bit and i always felt that i was in the shadows of the the top the top girls and that was okay but it was hard it was hard to deal with and you know I got through that but um the coaches um at that district meet there were coaches from all over all over seeking out great runners they wanted them to come to their universities and uh, run for them and uh you know here's this coach from Bloomsburg University and he was giving out information to my teammates well one of my teammates and she had finished up in the top top two or three I think that day and she was exceptional and he gave her a packet and he was just giving all these packets to other girls and here my mom said excuse me sir may I have one of those packets I think my daughter might look at this and so she, he said sure and he gave it to her and um, mom you know took the packet home we looked at it a little bit here and there and then you know, kind of put it down and then it was later on in, um, in my my um, guidance counselor brought Bloomsburg University up to me again when I was talking about filling out that application. And um, so we did. And I had picked a couple other schools. I guess the, the college idea kind of got into my head. I still wasn't keen on where it was going to take me, what I was going to do with my life. But um, OK, I, I said, OK. And so I applied and I, I got accepted at three different universities. And um, I did pick Bloomsburg University. And uh, we had gone to see it once. My mom took me for a day and we, we looked at it and I liked it. It was pretty neat. But so my senior year, I had planned on that and um, we were, I was going to go. I had a job at Procter & Gamble between the senior year and my first um, semester at Bloomsburg University. And I worked at Procter & Gamble and that was an excellent opportunity. But it was a hard job. I was out in the warehouse. It was extremely hot and um, it was a lot of hours for a kid um, to do, but I, I guess I wasn't really a kid anymore. I was 18 and, you know, trying to figure out how to save money. And anyway, um, this is kind of funny. My I overheard, you know, this a friend of mine saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to go off to school and I'm going to play soccer. And another one is going to go and she was going to run. And the one that had been better than me in high school was actually going to Bloomsburg University also. And she was she was being recruited. Um, and so she was talking about it quite a lot. And I thought, you know, I wasn't that far behind her in a lot of my runs and a lot of my things that I've done. And that summer I had kept up my running. I had run three or four days a week. And I thought, I'm, I'm, I might just think if I could run at Bloomsburg, I'm maybe going to call the coach. And so I called general admissions and I got the coach's number and I did. I picked the phone up in my kitchen you know, in and, and my family's kitchen, and I picked it up, and I called, and it was kind of a very bold move for me to make, but I did, and I got Coach Martucci on the line, and um, 
it was just something I he asked me the craziest questions well for the time it was crazy now I think how couldn't I have known the answers to those questions but it was like so what's your name and where are you from and how many miles a week do you run and of course I knew my name and where I was from but I didn't know how many miles I was running a week or a day I just ran I don't know I ran down the road and up the through the neighborhood and I ran the field and down the other dirt road and I'd come back and I think oh I ran for 20 minutes and I ran for 30 minutes because I would check the clock in the on the wall I don't think I even had a running watch back then I don't know so he would say well Okay, well, answer these questions for me. What do you run the mile in? And I said, well, I don't know. I have My never, sneakers? I've never done them. <laughs> yeah, my sneakers. I've never done track and field. I've never run track and field. I only ran cross country because to run around a circle was really pathetic for me to think of at that particular time, which now is not. <laughs> now, well, part of my other story is that track and field was a huge another amazing part of the running but um he asked me questions like well what do you run a 5k in and i had no idea what a 5k was and i mean this is you know 1991 we're talking we're not talking the stone ages you know i just had no idea i said i don't know but i finished 19th at districts and he goes oh okay and he said well i'll tell you what why don't you show up for cross country camp and i said well when is that and he told me the date and he told me the time and i said okay i'll be there so he he, op- he just allowed me. He didn't know what I looked like. He had never recruited me. There was no money there, nothing. I, I, I mean, whatever. And so I showed up. My mom took me. We, we packed all my college things and away I went. And I spent a week at Bloomsbury University with the cross country team. We're going to take one more quick break. We'll mm-hmm. finish this story. Okay. And it's going to be a short one. Okay. okay. <laughs> and we'll be right back on Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. Confidence. It's something we all search for. It's something we all strive for. When we're confident, we feel we can accomplish anything. Think about it. When you knew you looked good, you walked with your head held a little higher. Looking people in the eye was easy. You felt like you could tackle the world. The first step in finding that confidence is obviously how you look. And when you look good on the outside, you feel good on the inside. Get the confidence you need with Madeira Clinicals. They're a unique skincare company that specializes in complete skincare for women and men. From anti aging to glycolic and even a special clinical line for sensitive skin, Madeira Clinicals gives you the confidence. Make that change. Look brand new. Feel brand new with Madeira Clinicals. Check out MadeiraClinicals.com. That's M E D E R I Clinicals.com. Or call 866 646 3374. Take on the world with Madari Clinicals. Welcome back to Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. I'm Tom Jenkins, along with your host, Terry Martin, and our special guest in studio today, Tina Bartholomew, all about determination. And uh, your story has been phenomenal, mm-hmm. just phenomenal, Tina. It's There's one thing that keeps ringing in my head over and over and over again when I'm listening to you. And, and Terry kind of asked you the question indirectly, but failure is not an option in your life. It sounds to me when you when you uh, stubborn maybe or determination, <laughs> but when you set your mind to something, nothing gets in your way. Mm-mm. Never. And and that that blows my mind because there's so many people, myself included, where we get to certain points in our lives and we just throw our hands in the air and say, "Well, I can't say what I would normally say on the radio, but I, I, I'm done. I just can't do this anymore. And right. you've never thought that or never said that or no. uh, unless it was physically impossible that you really couldn't do it. But if there was a possibility, you moved forward. Right. But you must have gotten down low and, well, and you my, just my, get up there. Yeah. My question is, where did this termination come from and how do you do that? I think it it just comes from where I grew up and who I who I am. My parents were not easy on me for Mm -hmm. sure. Um, I'm, you know, my parents were divorced and um, growing up in two separate families and dealing with step parents and all that and back and forth. It makes, it makes you just grow up a little bit harder, I guess. I don't know. But um, I have to say my mom and my dad are both very hard workers. That is for sure. And so were my step parents or so are they. Um, Getting up at the crack of dawn and completing something before the sun even comes up was really what they were all about. And that's what I do now. You know, some of those early days were really just led me in that direction. So uh, hardworking. My mom, I don't know if I could ever ask for another hard, a more hardworking woman and loving woman. And my dad, 
physically hardworking, how he did some of the things he did, I don't know, and the heat and the, the climates and stuff. I think he must have lost his mind sometimes. But also my step parents too, the long hours, the dedication, that's something you grow up with and something that I have. I, I just do, it's part of me. There's, um, and obviously the show is called Make a Change, and it's right. all about people making changes in their lives. Uh, and we always have to make that conscious effort in the very beginning to make the decision to make the change. Yeah. And if if you were to give any advice to anybody who, who has heard what you just talked about today uh, and would like even the tiniest bit of that determination, what could you tell them? I would just say that don't ever let anybody get in your way. Um, if a coach is offering you something, an opportunity, take it. If an aunt offers you words of advice, take it. You can always just get rid of it, but take it and toil with it and see where it leads you. Um, my path has not been a straight path. You know, my path has not been paved by any means. But I can say that the people in my life that I have met and that have been my family and support and people that I met uh, through running that I never even knew before have offered me so much and I tried to take a little bit from everyone and become a better person because of them through them um, you know I was nothing I felt like I grew up just a typical little girl just like just like everybody else and I st I'm still a typical person I don't like to think that I'm exceptional I'm not until I look back at my times and the things that I've done I've never thought that I'm exceptional but when I look back I think I couldn't do that now I must have been exceptional I must have had some something in my you know a fizzle and or something extra erupting in me to make me perform that way and it is what got me through. I never wanted to be second. I don't want to be second. I want to be first. I want to be a leader. And I think that everybody in this world should go for everything that they've got. Luckily, I didn't go broke. Luckily, I didn't have anything bad happen to me. Um, you know, I've had injuries along the way. Those are probably the most hard hard times of, of being a runner, you know, truthfully. Um, yeah, getting beat, you come back up. You, you'll beat that person back again, and you'll get the times that you want. But the determination that it takes to get, you know, I get knocked down, I get back up again, I sure do, every time, because... You, you, the will to just be the best, the will to, to constantly better your times is just something that I, I love. I want to be until even today. I just ran a race this past weekend. I still wanted to be the winner. I don't know. I can't let that go. Speaking of people um, and advice and, and guidance that you've gotten, obviously your husband, Chaz, is, is a yeah. big part of your life. Is there anybody else that, that really stands out that has helped other than your parents and step parents that made you what you are today? Well... I have to say my coaches have all offered me an amazing opportunity and I've had, you know, three amazing coaches in my life's lifetime and they have all offered me in, in their heart, um, the, their, the charisma that they've had, that they've showed me that I can be something and they've, they've made my heart grow stronger. Um, I think, you know, they've just made me believe in myself and pushed me to the limits and always promised me that they would be waiting there at the finish line. Whether I fell flat on my face or not, they said, I'll be there waiting for you. And they always were. <laughs> they definitely always were. So those are some really important people. Oh, I couldn't even begin to imagine to, to, um, to name the people in my life that have helped me, you know, whether it's my a massage therapist who has given me wonderful thoughts, spiritually people, and in every way I've found people do believe in God and every some somehow or other within the first time I'm with them or the tenth time, something always happens that we talk about how that extra power has has been a benefit and has been something extra special that's pulled me through. And I, I believe that today. So well, we're down at the end of the show. And uh, before we completely wrap it up, first, congratulations. Oh, thank Absolutely. you very much. Absolutely. Congratulations. And when, when is this all going to take place? October 18th. That's awesome. Yeah. That it's, is so your, 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 your name is going to be up on that wall now. It, it, my name, yes, it will be. And, I, <laughs> you know, I want my girls, my four beautiful children and my husband, um, they're so proud. And I just want them to grow up being great, too. And mm -hmm. they already know that. Mommy wants them to be great at everything. But they'll they'll see that. It's 
just something that I am so proud. I am very proud of. Cool. Well, yeah. congratulations again. Oh, thank you. And uh, commercial time. One more time. Your bed and breakfast. The doctors in dot com. Yes. And where is it again? In Danville, Pennsylvania. Dan- mm-hmm. uh, Main Road. So it's on West Market Street. West Market Street in Danville. In the historical street of town. Wonderful. The doctors in dot com. Tina, thank you so much for being on the show today. Oh, it- Thank you. It's been an honor. Thanks for Thanks. talking about determination and, and setting my butt on fire a little bit, too. <laughs> I'm Makes totally inspired up and, now. Absolutely. <laughs> of course, if you have any questions, you can always give Terry a call at 866-646-3374. That's 866-646-3374. Check out her webpage, madariclinicals.com. This is Make a Change on 94.3 FM, The Talker. I'm Tom Jenkins, your host, Terry Martin. Thank you so much for listening. And Tina, again, thank you for being on the show today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Mm-hmm.